Uh, so, most actors will recount stories to you of uh, when they were children and being desperate to be on the stage. And I'm sure you too have memories of, of, of being children, doing the same thing where you're, I mean, I can picture myself with a, a hairbrush, pretending it's a microphone and singing in front of a mirror. Uh, I think we've all been there. Uh, but most of us sort of grow up and we leave those sorts of dreams of being on the stage behind us. Uh, actors don't. They have a quality in them that they stay, they stay forever young and they have this ability to connect with their inner child and, and tell stories um, and touch the hearts and minds of us, their, their audience. I didn't grow up to be an actor, I became a theatre director. And here's some of the images of shows that I've worked on as a director. Uh, Arms and the Man, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, this is uh, um, A Doll's House, Ibsen. Uh, that's Herbal Bed uh, by Peter Whelan. And uh, this was a project called Keepers of the Keys, set in uh, castles in, in Wales. So I now run Drama Studio London, so I spend most of my life uh, training actors. And uh, when, when we train actors, we spend most of our time encouraging them to work through their whole bodies, uh, to not be head-centred. Uh, what do I mean by that? It's about breath, it's about how we breathe. And, um, and making sure that every word spoken is completely connected through the body down to the feet uh, so that uh, a character that's created is inhabited. Um, it, it doesn't sit on the surface, it's not superficial. Um, now this is a very uh, simplistic uh, explanation of what is acting um, and you may even uh, like the story of the fact that we were generally always told uh, the basic rules of acting are learn your lines and don't bump into the furniture. And actually, that's also pretty sound advice as well. Um, but um, uh, I fell in love with theatre when I was probably about 10. And that love affair has sort of lasted with me all these years. And in that time, I've witnessed some extraordinary pieces of theatre that have tra transformed the way I see theatre. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about some of them today. So Top Girls. Now, I remember going to the Royal Court Theatre and seeing this. And it was an extraordinary play about the plight of working class women in Britain in the 1980s and the stark choices that they had to face. And I happened to be sitting in a seat um, behind, by chance, Neil Kinnock, who was the MP, as you know, the opposition leader at the time. And it felt a very exciting time to be at the Royal Court at the theatre, watching uh, Carol Churchill's play, thinking theatre and politics are colliding. This is a potential time for, for social change. Then I wanted to mention uh, the seven streams of the River Ota for its sheer theatricality. It moved um, through many dimensions. It, took us on journeys from Hiroshima to New York in the 1990s to Amsterdam. And it, uh, it used all manner of different styles of theatre traditions. So you had French farce, Japanese kabuki, and it also introduced to me a new acting style, which was referred to as hyperrealism, which meant that actors were seemingly simply in conversation. They weren't acting at all. I'd never seen anything like it. Angels in America I've chosen because Marianne Elliott's production was so moving, so touching, so uh, rich in its um, uh, exploration of the AIDS epidemic in that particular time in history. Crave by Sarah Kane. I was at a theatre conference in the Netherlands and by chance Sarah Kane performed herself in her own play that day. And a couple of weeks later, I was back in London, and I was on the underground reading the newspaper, and I read very sadly that she committed suicide. And I was very moved by this, and I remember reading uh, uh, in the article, it said that she had um, sort of 
felt that she, she could no longer see the future of theatre and in turn could therefore no longer see a future for herself. There was a phone call one Saturday morning from my youngest son saying, you have got to get to see The Inheritance by Matthew Lopez. And without having chance to ask any questions about what I was going to witness, I, I said, yes, I'll go today, put the phone down, and ran into central London, and uh, had to navigate my way through um, an Extinction Rebellion um, demonstration on one of the bridges, uh, with uh, the police on horseback, uh, with loud hailers saying, we are about to arrest you all, and me trying, trying to think, well, no, I'm only trying to get to the theatre, you know. Anyway, so I eventually fall into my seat, and suddenly this play begins, and, and opens my eyes to a whole new world and um, I suddenly realized that this writer Matthew Lopez is connecting the play to Ian Forster's wonderful novel Howard's End and as I'm watching it, it's six and a half hours by the way so there's lots of intervals I suddenly on the first interval I'm just desperate to speak to someone and I think that's true of theatre audiences in general they just want to connect and so I turn to the person sitting on my right and start speaking about what an amazing production it is and how I can see all these connections with Forster's work and, and what does he think of it. And it turns out to be Matthew Lopez himself, the writer. <laughs> now, he very kindly and generously spent every one of those intervals with me just so I could walk in his shoes and learn his story about how he came to write this, this exquisite piece of theatre. Um, I was an undergraduate when I remember watching on TV uh, the demonstrations in Tiananmen Square as uh, those students um, so bravely stood in front of those tanks. And if you remember, there was that image that burned in all our memories of that one uh, protester standing there with this, with, with this tank in front of them. And this was the starting point for Lucy Kirkwood's amazing play uh, called Chimerica. And Chimerica dealt with world politics, but at the same time managed to bring it back to us as individuals, to, from the macrocosm to the microcosm. Now, I put in Jerusalem, for one reason only, the extraordinary central performance in it from Mark Rylance. I think each generation has a performance that they live with and remember forever. And I think, for me, it may well be uh, Mark Rylance's. Then I've snuck in two for James Graham. Uh, James Graham wrote the beautiful play about the beautiful game, Dear England, about what it is to be English in, uh, in, in the era of a new world order, really, and looking at how that impacted through the game of football and our relationship to, to our, our national sport. Um, and then he created this house, which, to me, he achieved the seemingly impossible. He made us have empathy and sympathy for politicians, which I think in today's society, when we're so sceptical and cynical about the Westminster bubble, that's, that's quite remarkable. Uh, then the curious incident of the dog in the night time. Well, I was walking out of the theatre on that occasion, and I fell in step with another audience member, and she um, stopped and wanted to connect with me. And she said, that was my son. And she didn't mean that was my son on stage that night. What she meant was that was my son's story being told. She had a son with severe autism, and she felt that his story and his voice was um, given, given uh, an opportunity in that theatre space, and that all those people who come to see the show that night could understand a little bit more and connect with, with her experience and with her son's experience. And as she said to me, it gave her hope. I could go on about lots of productions, and uh, um, it's really just to, to say uh, there are so many that transform our lives forever. My late grandfather threw a question at me when I was 18 years old, and I was about to uh, leave home and go to university for the first time in London to study drama. And I was very excited. And he said, what is the point of theatre? 
And I was a bit surprised. He, he wasn't saying it aggressively or, or anything other than being, I suppose, perplexed. And he went on and said, we have an NHS that needs money. We need more hospitals to be built. What is the point of funding with public money theatre? I, I suppose I didn't have an answer. I just was silent. And I thought, I just don't have the experience to articulate why theatre is so important. It was a great privilege to have been friends with the late Ivan Kinsel. Ivan was a Czech dissident, and he became the most important theatre photographer of our age in Britain. He, um, he uh, worked with my late husband, who at the time ran the Royal Shakespeare Company, and uh, they did many, many productions together. Um, so, where does this particular story begin? It begins with the fall of communism in 1989 in the so-called Czechoslovakia, and who do they announce will be their new president? Of course, very sensibly, a playwright, Václav Havel. And it was announced that he would be coming to Britain for a state visit. So, Ivan phoned my husband and said, I want to bring uh, Václav Havel to the theatre to see your production in London. And so it was arranged. And Ivan brought Václav Havel and, uh, uh, to the Barbican, and the production was Peter Flannery's Singer, with Tony Scher in it. And seemingly, half the British cabinet most of the opposition and all the leading playwrights of, of the day crowded into the pit of the Barbican Theatre. And um, it was a very exciting, monumental moment in history where theatre and politics collide. And um, Terry wrote about this in The Guardian, so I'm just going to read a little extract from, from it for you. Later, after the party and the speeches, where Václav Havel spoke to the politicians as a writer and to the writers as a politician. I walked him back to his car and the outriders. The president was laughing and joking with his bodyguards, big, imposing Czechoslovakians with fierce Eastern European moustaches. They're all very friendly, I remarked to Ivan. Of course replied Ivan. They used to be actors in his theatre company. <laughs> that one there, he was a magnificent Macbeth. <laughs> and so the worlds of theatre and, uh, and uh, politics collide, it seems to me, in the most absurd and unexpected ways. So what should I have said to my grandfather? when I was asked that so difficult question, what is the point of theatre? Well, I think he was motivated by making sure I maybe chose a different career path, one that wasn't so close to the poverty line as the arts. But I would have began by agreeing with him. Yes, we do need to fund the NHS, Yes, it's important we build more hospitals and support all those healthcare workers in every possible way we can. But there is a but, and that but is that we must also always support the theatre and the arts as well. Because although medicine will heal the body, it is theatre that can heal the soul. And... The reason I'm saying that is it, it's because theatre reminds us we're not alone. It's a shared experience and it provides us with the opportunity for stories to be told collectively. And that's so important. Shakespeare says we are such stuff as dreams are made on. And the theatre provides us 
with a place for those dreams to be explored, to be shared, and to remind us that we're human. By chance, I came across a passage in a book, and uh, it, it's about theatre in the sense that it talks about art and humanity, and that one cannot live without the other, because art is the antidote. And when I read that, first of all, I just wished that I'd written it. But more importantly, I wish that I could have talked about it with my long-lost grandfather. Thank you.